Hello there, everyone. This is Derek Taylor, and this is our lecture uh, on uh, empire, uh, Tale of Two Empires on Spain and Britain. So the uh, chapter in your textbook will go over, you know, overseas expansions. We'll talk in detail, some detail about both of these, these empires, roughly up to the end of the 17th century, 1700, and talk about them and give you an overview and try to relate a little bit to what we've been talking about so far with state building and stuff like that. Uh, in uh, in the course, one thing, uh, just to note, uh, you may hear some dog barking in the background again. I apologize. Uh, my uh, my little one is hard to keep keep quiet sometimes. So uh, let's get into let's get into the lecture, shall we? I want to begin just by putting this in context because uh, we're talking about you know Europe within itself, Europe. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world, like indicated at the beginning of the the course in my first lecture, again is not the the dominant civilization in the world in 1500. It won't. It'll be on the cusp of being that by the end of this period, by the time of the French Revolution. I'm not quite there yet. So to keep that in mind, just give you I just a little bit of a background for this. In the early modern era, the 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 biggest powers, civil, most powerful civilizations in the world are in Asia, uh, particularly Ming Dynasty China. This is uh, about 1405. This is a map showing you where there are actual overseas voyages being uh, supported by the Chinese state. Nothing comes of them. They, they discontinued them by the 1430s, but they have their own fleet. They do explore. They actually make their way, as you can see from the map, all the way to Africa in the 15th century, uh, but it's Ming Dynasty China, which is the wealthiest civilization on earth. The other, um, the other wealthier, more powerful parts of the world actually in 1500 is the Islamic world. And particularly for our purposes, the Ottoman Empire is gonna play a role we're gonna talk about, especially with Spain. But also there are three other empires, the uh, Songhai Empire, uh, Western Africa, centered around Timbuktu, the Savafid Shiite uh, Empire, modern day Iran, and the Mughal Emperor, uh, Mughal Empire of uh, India in the, uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. So you have these big wealthy empires. My point here is that Europe is just becoming coming into its own. And virtually none of them, except we'll get to the Spanish in a second, really have any sort of comparability to these empires. As you're going to see in a moment, they're on the retreat from Islam for a greater part of this period. It's only at the end of this period uh, in 1683 when um, the Ottomans failed to take uh, Vienna for the last time that things began to change. Again, another look at uh, early modern Europe, you know, 1500 or so, again, that map just showing you, you know, again, how far the Ottomans get into uh, into Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and just, you know, none of these, these, these entities as entities themselves, as nations, as states uh, are comparable for the most part. And Europe's very divided and the Ottomans know this. They make separate treaties with a lot of different European powers throughout the 16th and 17th centuries to play them off each other. So that's a part of this, this equation as well. However, by the 15th century, you already have Europeans beginning to explore other parts of the world, in particular the Portuguese begin this. The Portuguese who have their small kingdom on the, on the west coast of Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, begin exploring first the Canary Islands in the 14th century, then the Cape Verde Islands, and then they make their way to Africa. By the 1450s, they're already trading in Africa, and they establish their first, um, their first bases uh, on the mainland in 1482. Venetians will actually carve out territory, uh, if you can imagine, in uh, uh, in the Congo in the 1480s. So uh, you already have European exploration well before what we think of as the early modern, or the, this is why you could begin the early modern period here if you wanted. And of course, the, the Portuguese are the best sailors uh, in Europe at this point. They're the ones who will make their way around the southern end of Africa, all the way to Inda, India, Vasco da Gama. Portuguese will also set up ports there for trade. So it's already beginning by the time Spain comes into this picture. And of course, one last uh, map. You're gonna have, of course, civilizations in uh, in the, the Americas that they don't even know about, of course, in the 15th century, particularly the Aztecs and the Incas, but also the League of the Iroquois up in uh, Northeastern uh, United States. 
of course, which are bigger in some ways and more wealthy than the Europeans. And so you're going to have, you know, it's part of this world it doesn't even recognize it's there. They're just coming into, the Europeans are on the make. And if you're wondering again, why the aggressiveness of European explorers, one of the reasons is they are hungry for wealth and things like that. They don't, they haven't had that much in a, a relative degree vis-a-vis um, -vis other nations. And we'll get to their ideology in a second. <clears throat> First thing to talk about when we talk about Spain, I forgot to mention this, I think when I've talked about them so far, the Spanish crown is a recent creation. Before 1492, it's, there, it a, there are two big ones, the kings of Castile and Aragon in Spain. They're united in 1492. There's no guarantee that it'll become the Spanish crown. It's really not until the 1520s and 30s that it's definitely you know, settled into being a single state. And that's something to keep in mind because Spain gets created as a state out of the Reconquista. The Reconquista is the reconquest of the Spanish peninsula from the Muslim kingdoms of Spain, which is finally brought to fruition the same year uh, as the Union of uh, Castile and Aragon, 1492. And so Spanish exploration and imperialism is gonna emerge out of this. And this is very important because on the one hand, it emerge out of, emerges out of that process of state building I've already talked about as it will with uh, the English slash British, we'll get that distinction in a second as well. Uh, but also more specifically because of the Reconquista, it has a religious edge to it, both in terms of you know holy war, fighting the, the, the Muslims, the infidels, but also conversion. <clears throat> These would be two major things that are important for the Spanish. <clears throat> and of course, another thing that's important about this, the Habsburgs are, um, they have that zeal um, for you know holy war. When Charles V becomes king of Spain, then uh, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Habsburgs take on the responsibility as Holy Roman Emperors as protectors of Europe. So they are also dealing with Ottoman expansion into uh, southeastern Europe. Again, remember the uh, the uh, Ottomans take over Hungary or parts of it in the fifteen twenties. They uh, lay siege to Vienna in 1529. They are preoccupied throughout this period with Ottoman advance. The Ottomans uh, lay siege to the city of Rhodes in, uh, in the 1520s. They laid siege to Malta in 1565. So there, and I will get to the moment, there's a famous victory in 1571 at Lepanto, which is a key turning point uh, for the Spanish <clears throat> in terms of dealing with the Ottomans. Well, not the Ottomans themselves, we'll get to. So you have this rivalry between the Habsburgs and the Ottomans for imperial control in Europe, which also has to do with religion. Uh, but you also have, you know, this will, uh, this, will uh, this will feed into the Habsburg uh, imperial ideals, meaning, and I'll show you in a moment, imagery, symbols, mottos. It will draw on this idea, this crusading idea of we're spreading the faith and we're fighting the infidel. We'll also draw on, as I'll show in a second, Images, ideas drawn from antiquity. You know, this is the age of humanism. And so they know their, their Roman history very well. And that's what will feed into both uh, Spanish, but also English and British uh, ideas of empire as well. One last thing to mention here, because I'll have to come back to the Inquisition. If I didn't explain what Inquisitions were in the Middle Ages, they are essentially special courts set up with inquisitors to go inquire about heresy. Uh, again, heresy is a uh, in the Spanish mind, in the medieval mind, a threat to social order. And in the Middle Ages, basically all that would happen is a, an inquisitor would come to the town, he would announce an inquisition, he would take um, anyone who wanted to make accusations of heresy could. Uh, basically, it was, it was meant to give people a chance to, if they were accused, come and repent. And most people did in the Middle Ages. There were hardly any sort of like, you know, mass burnings or stuff like this. If you went about auto de fe's. That comes in with the Spanish Inquisition, partly because it is a matter of state building. The Inquisition in Spain was uh, given a, a papal, um, in, uh, papal um, dispensation to basically run itself. Normally, you'd have oversight from the papacy. What happens, it's, it's instituted in Spain in 1478. What happens with is it quickly becomes a sort of 
tool of the of the emerging Spanish monarchy, because once they unite the crowns, they begin to sort of use it to sort of use accusations of heresy to uh, to attack what they think of as, as fifth columns in the state, um, recently converted Jews, Muslim stuff like that. People they don't think their conversions are sincere. Of course, something like this can be abused. People will use it for their own purposes. That's where you'll get the 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 the, the number of actual people who actually uh, are turned over to the state to be executed by the Inquisition in its entire history, 350 years, is about three to five thousand. Most of that happens within the first 30 years or so of the of the United Crown, basically. And it is what we know today, it's most of the state driving this, not the church. I mention this because this will also be brought this process of inquisition to the new world. And that's a controversial thing. So we'll get back to that as well. But that comes out of this whole process of state building with a specific religious context that it has in Spain. A few images here to illustrate imperial ideals. This is taken from a genealogy. It was published about 10 years after his death, but this is the coat of arms of Charles V, and I like this image in particular. The double eagle is the, is the, has been for a long time the, um, the, the emblem of the Holy Roman Emperors, so that's not new, the double eagle. Uh, the old Byzantine emperors used to use a double eagle. The Ottomans, from what I understand, also used a, used a double eagle at times. So that's part of this, you know, sort of the imperial crown, the closed crown, the orb representing the world. But you also have these two pillars beside it. And you have in Latin there, the V is a U, plus ultra. And those are Latin terms meaning further beyond. What does that mean? As you can see, see this, what's beneath this here, these are the pillars of Hercules, uh, pillars of Hercules, I stepped backwards. Pillars of Hercules, pillars of Hercules. These are the rocks, basically, that represent the entranceway from the Iberian Peninsula out into the Atlantic Ocean. They mark the limits of, you know, the known world and the ancient world. And so the motto, going further or further beyond, indicates, of course, his empire is stretches beyond antiquity. So there's that sort of that element there, that propaganda element in his coat of arms, which I kind of like. Here you have a medal <clears throat> struck by his successor, Philip II of Spain from 1602. On the right-hand side, you had ships um, with a Latin motto there, posunt que posse videntur. Basically, it means something like, they can who think they can. <laughs> Again, that's, <laughs> you know, because we think we're the universal empire, we can go take it all, apparently, something like this. And then my favorite one, which I'll go to in a second here, you have an image of a horse standing over the world. This is a reference to the fact that by the late 16th century, the, the, um, the Habsburg Empire stretches to all four major continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Or not Africa, but the Americas and, uh, and Europe. And uh, on one side, you have a phrase here, co saltus uh, in sequor, by Latin is bad, but it means something like um, follow the chase or <clears throat> follow where you lead or follow where you chase, something like that to follow where you chase <clears throat> or leap, reference to the horse that's being over the world. <clears throat> but there's another phrase here, non sufficit orbis. That means something like the world does not suffice or the world is not enough. And that's a, that's a, that's a phrase with two meanings, by the way. The world, meaning this is an Im intimation of world empire. The world is not enough. My ambitions are, are like that, right? This is what makes people like in England, which is a much smaller power and Protestant in the 16th century, really terrified of the Spanish and later on the French. The theories of universal empire are bad. Uh, until the Brits become an empire, then it's great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it also can mean the world in religious terms. The world as opposed to the church or the world opposed to Christ, right? It's an apocalyptic has apocalyptic uh, overtones. The world is not enough. Conversion is more important than universal empire. So it captures those two, those two things in one nice little phrase. So interesting that uh, that great, um, uh, again, this is imperial pop again, right? And I have to mention this, if you haven't heard that phrase before, the English version of it I gave you, the world is not enough. Well, <clears throat> take a look here. This is a completely fake made up coat of arms. And by the way, many coats of arms are basically fake and made up too. 
Um, this is a fake coat of arms made by Sir Ian Fleming for James Bond in his 1963 uh, novel on His Majesty's Secret Service. Notice the uh, motto at the bottom of this fake made up coat of arms, Orbis non suffici, the world is not enough. <laughs> and uh, he didn't know this, but he had a friend who was a, a heraldic researcher, came up with that phrase, which he put in the book, which gets into the film version of this book in 1969, which becomes, maybe if, I don't know if any of James Bond fans out there, 1999 film with Pierce Brosnan, the world is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> comes from the Habsburg family uh, delusions of grandeur. So there you go. That's why you pay the big bucks to take courses at JCCC uh, to know stuff like this. But that's what you enjoy. That's kind of a fun fact there. So that's the, uh, the Habsburg Spain. What about English in, the English in terms of their colonial policy? Well, <clears throat> their situation is very different, obviously. England's not a great power at the end of the 16th century when they start into this. In fact, they start late, as you'll see, colonizing. And part of their reason for doing so in the first instance is geo, uh, geopolitical. They want to oppose Spain and its power. And in fact, both England and the Netherlands will um, direct some of their policies against um, the Spanish, Dutch merchants, Dutch privateers, English privateers, pirates in other words. We'll try to pick off, of course, gold, gold and silver shipments going back from, to Spain from the New World. Uh, and you also have them, um, because of their lack of resources, turning to commercial um, commercial trading as a way of making you know, money off of exploration. The Dutch will emerge as the great financial capital of Northern Europe after they break away from Spain in the 16th, late 16th centuries. They'll eventually replace the Portuguese as the great trading power in, the, uh, in Asia, in you know, India, West Africa, places like that. Uh, they'll create trading companies uh, and they'll both engage in what are essentially mercantile policies of state supported manufacturing and trade. They can't compete with, you know, Spain and its unlimited amount of silver. You know, the Spanish uh, colonies, as you can see, Spanish Empire is very agrarian otherwise. Well, you're going to have trading ports that are important for both the British and the, uh, the Dutch. Uh, and in fact, what you're going to have set up there is you're going to have <clears throat> joint stock companies where you have people invest, private investors uh, form the mix along with some help from government in Britain uh, to, to uh, build its empire. The East, English East Indies, India Company, the East Indies Company uh, in 1600 is created when uh, 200 or so British investors petition the queen to approve a royal charter for them. And they get a monopoly of all English trade in Asia. So again, in return, the crown gets to regulate the company as it sees fit. As it sees fit and uh, the British parliament has to uh, re renew the charter every 20 years. And so you're gonna have them, you know, having uh, creating not just the in English East India companies, but companies which will uh, go to Africa by the 1660s, India very short, shortly after this, they'll have posts all over several different places. Um, and um, these, these kind of companies, by the way, are almost like little governments in themselves. Even though they, they set up trading posts, they are given powers by the government to, uh, to mint coins, to establish courts, to wage war if necessary. So they become, they're sort of like government contractors. This is empire by contract, by, by, by private contractor, basically, in the case. So it's much more direct in the case of Spain. They have officials on the ground. As you can see, there's not much. It's private companies doing this stuff for the most part in England in the English sphere. And then finally, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned the, uh, the English don't get into the game of overseas exploration until the late 16th century. With one exception, much closer to home, the English begin colonizing and treating Ireland like a colony in the late 16th century. They, in fact, will, uh, this will be a precedent for things like land confiscation. They'll confiscate land from the, uh, from the, uh, from the Irish uh, to give to English courtiers. And also uh, it develops attitudes. They develop some, an ideology first of empire in, an, in Ireland. If you know who Edmund Spencer was, who was the author of a courtier, Elizabethan courtier and <clears throat> author of an influential poem, The Fairy Queen, also was a, 
a, a, a colonizer in Ireland with a, a view a work called the uh, View of the Something of I can't remember the name of the title, but name of the title, but it's influential because he advocates treating Ireland like a conquered people. And it, yeah, you get this ideology that is influenced by antiquity, both Spain and England. They're thinking about the Roman Empire. And for example, when they talk about the, the Irish, the English, and most of the ones who are colonizing England are from Southern England where they have a lot of settled agriculture. Well, the Irish, of course, in the 16th century are a bunch of you know pastoralists. They don't have a lot of settled agriculture. And so they seem as being backward and uncivilized for that reason. You throw on top of that, of course, the religious aspect, uh, because of course they're papists, they're idolatrous. So they have, a, uh, they have two marks against them. The, the English know you can be civilized without being Christian. They have evidence from antiquity, um, but you can't be, of course, if you're a papist apparently. So this is, becomes kind of a justification for, you know, all the 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 um, deep the the imposition of you know later on the Scots and everything into into Ireland. But it's sort of a dry run um, for how they'll uh, colonize overseas, and definitely uh, develops their ideology of an empire there as well. Few symbols of imperial ideology from, from Britain. This is a, the frontispiece, the cover, front cover of Sir Walter Raleigh's History of the World from 1614. As you can, kind of, I don't know if you can read this down there on the on, on the actual uh, front of it. You can see the writing. Oh, look at above first. You have the eye of providence, providencia, looking over the globe. If you, you can't read that right there, you, what you have there are two lines of ships lined up for battle. Pretty clearly one is the Spanish, the other <laughs> is the British. Of course, they defeat them. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have fama bona, good fame, fama mala, bad fame. The Spanish are the bad fame, the British are the good fame. Down here, you have experiencia, teacher on the one side, and veritas on the other in those two, between those two columns, and magistra vitae, uh, teacher of life on the uh, on the bottom there, Morse, death and oblivion down there. So uh, the teacher of life, uh, you know, this is this is good propaganda, right, for the history of the world according to the emerging Protestant power here. And this other just an example of this again before before they're even Britain before they're even much of an empire they have colonies but really it's only at the end of the 18th end of the 17th beginning of the 18th century Britain really becomes a great empire on the left hand side you have a coin from the Roman Empire itself Antoninus Pius the reign of Antoninus Pius emperor Antoninus Pius circa 1454 125 AD with the image of the goddess Britannia which is a symbol of you know symbol of Britain you know uh, the Romans ruled Britain. On the right hand side, you have a coin, a farthing, English farthing, minted in 1672 by King Charles II of England, based on this coin. Uh, and so again, even before there's much empire there, the Brits are thinking in those terms. Uh, again, that rivalry between those two, those two great powers, again, they produce their own ideology in order to sort of present their, as it were, their ideological case their subjects. <clears throat> so talk about the Spanish Empire for a moment. <clears throat> exploration and you know, conquest, there should have been sort of said, conquest, exploration, conquest, and settlement begins well before um, they find their way to the Americas. Over the course of the 15th century, the kingdom of Castile at that point, not Spain, Castile conquers most of the Canary Islands, as you saw the coast of uh, coast of Africa. <clears throat> and as well, Castile fights a naval war with Portugal in, 14, in the 1470s. They lose badly <laughs> because the Portuguese are the best sailors in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the Europe at that point. But the important thing to note here is the terms of the treaty are basically that Spain has to stay out of the southern latitudes. They can't go down to Africa and colonize. As you see, the, the East is blocked off by, you know, Muslim powers, the Portuguese are there, they go West, which is of course where Columbus comes in in 1492. I won't belabor this, you must know something about this from high school. Uh, Columbus of course sails in 1492, uh, thinking to go to the Indies, uh, to make it to Asia uh, as a way of getting around uh, all these obstacles, runs into a whole new continent, 
And by the way, he just if you don't know this, uh, he knew very well the Earth was round. Everybody knew the Earth was round in the Middle Ages. The sailors all knew the Earth was round. That's a myth. Comes from the 19th century. Everybody knew the Earth was round. Just didn't know how big it was. Uh, and so he finds, of course, um, islands in the Caribbean. He will set up shop there. Eventually, he's a very bad governor, <laughs> uh, kind of brutal guy, and they rip him out, bring him back. Uh, but eventually, you have the the uh, the Spanish exploring the rest of the Caribbean, taking over. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but also sending out explorers into uh, other parts of the um, the North American continent. Once they've discovered there's another continent there. People like Balboa, not Rocky Balboa, uh, but the uh, Spanish explorer who makes his way to the, the Pacific Ocean for the first time, you know, the Isthmus of Panama, who took along with him, by the way, to Balboa on his expedition, a young conquistador named Francis, uh, Francisco Pizarro. A second again, uh, but people like, you know, Ponce de Leon, Juan Ponce de Leon, who discovers Florida, my home state. Uh, named the land of flowers because it was discovered on uh, Palm Sunday uh, in uh, in uh, the early 1500s. Uh, Hernando de Soto, of course, makes his way up through uh, middle parts of the United States, as well as, uh, I can't remember the man's first name, my name Navaris, de Navaris. Uh, his expedition, doomed expedition, goes off in the 15, late 1520s to Florida, shipwrecked, and the handful of survivors have to sort of make their way from Florida all the way into Texas to get back down to um to mexico city they get captured sold into slavery the main source we have this is a man named cabeza de vaca who was a one of these people who survived this 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 doomed expedition so also went and wandered around the deserts of northern mexico and texas for like 10 years before he came back to to mexico city in the 1530s and 40s so you have all this exploration going on up to the 1550s obviously and then finally, again, just to bring us back to this, when we're talking about all this exploration, you know, my area between Portugal and Spain, Pope Alexander VI uh, issues a bull in, that's a document, in, uh, in 1493, the Pope, uh, called Intercetera, which basically um, grants Spain a certain amount of jurisdiction over the newly discovered continent for the purpose of converting the natives. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the doctrine of discovery. It gives, it grants Spain and Portugal um, jurisdiction, legal and otherwise, for doing this. This is usually taken to be, you know, the justification for uh, empire and conquest, stuff like this. Um, but again, remember that that's important to the Spanish because of the background in which they come, the unification of that state. So that's the beginning of that in terms of that uh, that part of their imperial ideology as well. And of course, from the beginning in the 1490s, they take over in short succession over the next 20 years, once um, uh, Columbus gets to the Caribbean, you know, first he lands on island Hispaniola, um, they eventually find places like uh, Cuba and dominate it, take it over. Uh, combination of disease and warfare nearly wipes out, of course, the native inhabitants of uh, most of these islands because of this. So have that uh, in the background. And eventually, uh, Hernan Cortez, who's a member of the Spanish gentry, uh, decides to take his uh, a band of uh, conquistadors to the mainland in 1519. They've heard stories of the Aztec Empire, and um, they land there and they, 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 go through too, too quickly. He conquers the Aztecs, <clears throat> which if you don't know why he does this, um, or how he gets this done, because there's only a few hundred soldiers, like 100,000 people in Tenochtitlan uh, when he goes into uh, what is today Mexico City. The Aztec were uh, an empire that built themselves up from the 1430s in central Mexico. And they're actually an alliance of three different peoples. The main power in that alliance is the Mexica, M-E-X-I-C-A, where we get Mexico from. They're the dominant partner in that. And then there's the uh, Tlaxcalans, and there's another, I guess the Tex, I can't remember the name of the other group. They're subordinate to say the least. And um, one of the reasons he succeeds is because the other two tribes, the other two peoples want to get rid of the Mexica. And so because of their efforts, as well as of course, disease, which strikes um, Montezuma, their ruler, um, he gets an alliance with these subject peoples. And uh, they, it enables them after that outbreak of smallpox to enter the city and uh, to um, take it over. 
uh, because they do have they do have guns and weapons, but there's like a, again, they would have been wiped out if it hadn't been for those things uh, involved being involved in that. Of course, in the 1530s, uh, uh, Francisco Pizarro, who had been part of um, Vasco uh, de Balboa's, you know, trips uh, to Panama, uh, served as mayor, uh, first as the mayor of Panama City for, uh, for a few years, and then undertakes two expeditions to go down to Peru and try to conquer the Aztecs, which he fails. 1529, he goes back, uh, and eventually uh, he does um, make his way to Peru, founds a settlement there. After a series of maneuvers, he manages to capture the uh, Incan Emperor Atahualpa, 1532. He gets a, a, a king's ransom, a room full of gold uh, as a ransom, but he charges him with crimes and executes him in 1533. The same year, Pizarro enters the capital of uh, Cusco uh, and completes his conquest and founds the city of Lima uh, a couple of years later, eventually gets killed um, uh, in the uh, process of completing the conquest. So you have the conquest of Latin America there. You also have later on uh, to protect, because uh, the silver trade will be the sort of lifeblood of the empire to protect the routes going to and from Asia and Europe. They'll establish a couple of outposts with the Spanish. The first permanent settlement in North America is at St. Augustine, 1565. <clears throat> I want to say it's the guy's name is Menendez, who is the captain who plants the Spanish flag, claims it for the church. Names it after St. Augustine of Hippo. And so that's still a day. St. Augustine, Florida, it's a nice town. Good place for vacation. Uh, but the same year, they also entered the Philippines in 1565. Again, eventually, um, eventually, um, again, for as a, a port city, eventually being to take over most of the islands uh, over time. So you have a global empire uh, within 70, 75 years' time being created by the Spanish. <laughs> Here's the image of it, uh, and I forgot to mention this, uh, mention this in a moment. But in 1580, they'll actually they'll actually unite with the Kingdom of Portugal, so they'll have their territories as part of the same crown as well. So in the 1580s, the Spanish Empire, the Habsburg Empire, is at its height. They claim all this territory in Spain, Florida, down into uh, South America, but of course the Spanish territories are all down here, and of course the Philippines as well. And remember, they still have territories in Europe. The Kingdom of Sardinia, Naples, a couple of duchies up here, and then of course the Spanish Netherlands up here. Huge world empire, still not as big or as powerful as wealthy uh, as say the Chinese. Um, the Chinese never never bother trading with anybody for anything except for silver in this period. It's the only thing we have. The Westerners have they want. They do take Spanish silver uh, in this period, but that's about it. But this is the first Western world empire. So how is this governed? Well, there's a vice regal structure. It's particularly called the vice royalty of New Spain. There's also a vice royalty of, of Peru later on. And so you have a bureaucracy uh, which evolves eh, piecemeal up to the end of the half century period by 1700 to include basically everything in, in uh, the Americas plus the Philippines. And you're going to have uh, an elaborate hierarchy. The king has a council of the Indies, a supreme governing body um, composed between six and 10 counselors, which is supposed to issue, prepare and issue all the legislation of the colonies in the king's name, uh, approves all important acts and expenditures by colonial officials, and is sort of a last court of appeal. It's sort of the ultimate body below the king doing things. Down to the viceroy, uh, who is the sort of military, sort of the political leader. Uh, coming from the center, uh, as well as administrative and judicial tribunals called audiencias, uh, provincial administrators call, uh, called governors or uh, and um, uh, corregidores or alcaldes mayores and uh, municipal councils. So there's this long, there's a, there is a big bureaucracy, at least for the time, uh, coming through, down through Spain. However, however, in practice, this chain of command usually breaks down or is circumvented under the Habsburgs, meaning that the ruling dynasty from Charles V onward was so preoccupied with affairs in Europe, with fighting the Ottomans, with all the things that are going on, for the most part, uh, and that, you know, the great distances between them and the Americas basically gave them, let uh, colonial officials have a great deal of latitude 
uh, and local elites have a great deal of latitude to do what they wanted as long as they maintain its, maintain social control and sent back money to the to the home country. Hence, benign neglect. I'm calling it. <clears throat> And in fact, the system they set up is basically a tribute system in a way, where they're sending back essentially tribute to the mother country, which kind of goes along with the old Aztec system. Um, once the conquistadors had conquered Mexico, Spain's monarch rewarded them with plots of land called encomiendas. Okay, encomiendas. I don't speak Spanish that well. Uh, which included the Native American tradition of tribute, uh, that is labor or produce or something like this. Uh, in return from Indian communities. Once gold and silver was discovered, the value of these land grants, of course, increased exponentially, and they, they utilized the pre-existing uh, system that made Indian workers available to the mines. And that's, that's why Spain becomes fabulously wealthy uh, about the part, uh, part of the 16th and 17th centuries. So in other words, you have a weak colonial state governed informally through mechanisms that rewarded uh, new, uh, new Spain's elites by allowing them to exploit the indigenous peoples and the resources they have there. And this is why, by the way, you did have, there were supposed to be officials, the viceroy of the colonial officials, charged with ensuring fairness to the natives. Uh, in practice, of course, it was easy for local officials to ignore this, especially because their livelihood depended upon them extracting resources from the natives, especially the farther you got away from Mexico City. So it is an extractive sort of empire in that, in that in system in that sense. And then finally, again, to mention, you know, to bring this back to the creating an imperial government, they, long story, but in 1580, the, uh, well, for a few years, Portugal had actually been governed because they had no other heir to the throne, governed by a, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, was the only claimant with royal blood to the throne. Once he died, there's still a, a debate about this, the Spanish basically sent troops into Portugal and occupied the country. They brought it into the Spanish, or but they didn't get, they let it have its own laws, they basically let it run itself, but they gave Portugal, Portuguese counselors, you know, places at the Spanish court. And so it became part of this one empire. So again, state building, trying to get as big as possible is, you should see this is all part of one process, even of course, it's a very different on the ground, obviously, in, in the Americans. <clears throat> so that's in brief an overview of the Spanish empire. What about the colonies of North America? And I'm calling them colonies and not an empire yet, it's an empire in a way, but because it's very different to a certain degree than in Spain. Uh, there is early exploration of the uh, of the North American continent. John Cavan, an English explorer, gets to the northwest coast, northeast coast, I should say, of uh, of what they be Canada, Newfoundland, goes in a little bit. In fact, you had uh, English fishermen who knew about fishing areas off the coast of North America before the, by the end of the 15th century. They'd known about that. But because of things like the Reformation and stuff like that going on in Europe, they don't get around to start settling until the 1580s. But of course, Spain becomes a big threat uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the English. And if you're wondering why, by the way, that's because of well, the Reformation. Once Elizabeth I becomes the king, it's clear she's not going to turn back to Catholicism. Uh, she's excommunicated by the Pope in 1570, and Spain is preparing for a long time to invade the country to try to you know, turn that back. So that's why they're looking for you know, ways to sort of you know, poke the Spanish bear, try to settle Newfoundland in uh, Newfoundland, I'll pronounce that, in Canada in 1583, fails, eventually will, or part of the 17th century. Same time, you have English, uh, English captains, privateers, pirates, uh, going around, you know, seizing Spanish ships, destroying Spanish ships. One of them, Francis Drake, of course, circled the globe uh, in uh, in fifteen seventies. And finally, of course, you have the establishment, the attempted establishment of a colony in uh, in modern day North Carolina. You've probably heard about the Lost Colony of Roanoke. They are left there. The dates are hazy in my mind. I don't have them in my notes for some reason. I want to say it's they they leave them there because they have to leave in fifteen eighty seven. 
And so, uh, or was it 1585? I can't remember which, but basically that's a leave behind this colony for several years because of, well, because of the Spanish Armada that's starting to invade in 1588. By the time the uh, proprietor of the colony gets back in 1590, everyone's gone, of course. And the only message left from the colony is, you know, the word Croatan is, is a card on the tree. The best guess at this point, they've actually found there's some evidence for this, that they, they went and uh, merged with a, a friendly tribe uh, probably just settled with them and never came never came back to the old uh, settlement. But uh, again, failure to colonize because of this in the late 16th century. Not until the early 17th century that the founding of another one of these joint stock companies, the uh, Virginia Company, 1607, makes its way to what will become Virginia, founds Jamestown in 1607, uh, that, uh, that southern end. Then, of course, 13 years later, you're going to have the Pilgrim Fathers. Um, these are English separatists, basically. They are people who reject the Church of England, and so they left, actually, to go to Holland, to the Netherlands, before this, and they leave the Netherlands to go to Plymouth, uh, where they set this up, of course. You know, the Mayflower Compact, all that stuff. Uh, Bradford won't belabor this. Um, they are fleeing persecution because they're separatists. They they did not. They basically think there shouldn't be a state church. That's why they have to flee. I mentioned that because you should not confuse them with the Puritans, who are not really fleeing persecution. <laughs> they really aren't. Um, the Puritans are those Calvinists in the Church of England who want the Church of England to be reformed. Charles the First doesn't care for their ideas, and so they they leave to go where they can set up their own version of the church, their ideal version of the Christian church. And this is the beginning of the Great Puritan migration. So you have these more orthodox Calvinists fleeing in the 1630s up to the 1640s till the start of the Civil War. A lot of them go back <laughs> in England to fight <laughs> against the king. Uh, about 20,000 people migrate from the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630 uh, by John Winthrop, Winthrop and Company up to the 1640s. This will be the start of a very different series of a uh, different type of colony because Jamestown's a sort of plantation colony that eventually hit on tobacco as a, a plantation crop. So it's a little more like the Spanish colonies and that the Spanish colonists are mostly men, they're mostly, you know, conquistadors, military types. Whereas the Puritans bring families. They, from the beginning, mean to settle and found, a, a, found another version of their own society there. So that's a big difference. Another group that definitely is, unlike the Puritans fleeing uh, persecution uh, to the Americas in the 1630s are the Catholics. Uh, 1632, Charles I grants Lord Baltimore, who's a Catholic courtier, nobleman, uh, the right to found a colony for his co-religionists in, uh, in Maryland. It's not named after, I don't think the Virgin Mary, it's named after Queen Henrietta Maria, who is Charles I Catholic, French Catholic wife. And so you have a haven for Catholics being created in the 1630s. And then finally, you also have, uh, all this is done for the most part, you know, with by private enterprise, the founding of colonies in the West Indies, that is to say in the Caribbean, uh, Southern Caribbean especially, Bermuda is founded, uh, is uh, colonized in 1609 by private investors. And later on, there'll be several islands, uh, St. Kitts, the first one, 1625, the government actually does this to have outposts there, partly to help with, you know, pirating <laughs> Spanish ships the, for, for, again, geopolitical reasons. But also St. Kit, I mentioned St. Kitts, Antigua, Montserrat, uh, and Barbados, which I'll come back to as well. I'll show you the map in a second, in addition to all that. And then finally, in the latter half of the 17th century, they expand greatly. The first settlements of the Carolinas are undertaken in 1651 by English settlers. In the 1660s, the Carolina, Carolina is actually its own one single thing at that point, is turned into a royal colony. In the 1650s as well, you have a bunch of other settlers coming to Barbados from Ireland. I say settlers because those are people who fought against Cromwell in Ireland who are deported to uh, Barbados as indentured servants. In fact, there are so many, I think mean, there's like, I said there's like 20,000 Irish, there's a bunch of Irish sent to Barbados. There are so many sent there that the word Barbados comes, becomes a verb for being exiled or deported. When you, when you get deported from the border, you are Barbados in the 17th century, if you can imagine. At the same time, uh, Oliver Cromwell, 
one of the few great military leaders England had before the 18th century, also seizes the island of Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655. This is a great coup. And you finally got, you, you, you poke the Spanish bear, the Spain's uh, declining power by the 1650s. But hey, took a big island, becomes profitable. Uh, and in fact, it's the Caribbean colonies that are going to be the West Indies, the profitable, the real engine of the English empire because of sugar. Um, they start growing sugar there. That's by far the most profitable thing that is produced. Much more important for them than the North American colonies ever were or would be. Uh, and then finally, of course, you had the middle colonies uh, uh, in the 1660s or the territory that's going to become these three colonies of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, which the English uh, settlers take from the Dutch. The Dutch come into New York in the 16th, well, Manhattan Island in the 1620s. They, uh, the Dutch themselves take over Delaware, which is founded by the Swedes in the 1630s. And in turn, the English who are, as we'll see, fighting wars back in Europe with the Dutch. That's right, the Protestants are fighting each other. Uh, they take those colonies from them, which is ratified in the 1670s after the last Dutch war. Or the second Dutch War, I should say. And so you have uh, the, so you have this happening because of again, imperial warfare. The one of these, the one exception, of course, is Pennsylvania. That's granted to William Penn, the Quaker. The Quakers are a religious minority who are despised in England. And so Charles II, who owes William Penn's father's money, father money, uh, donates a bunch of land to him in, in, uh, in the Americas instead. And so it becomes a haven for his co-religionists there. <clears throat> this is a map just to show you what uh, actually, they had actually taken the, um, the English by the end of the 17th century, by 1689. Very little inland. I mean, you can see most of New Jersey settled. <laughs> we got New Jersey uh, back then, but again, you see like, it's mostly on the coast. They're just beginning to push inland by the end of the 17th century. The South is almost wholly on the coast, farthest in, of course, in you know Virginia and Maryland, and then in Massachusetts. Up here, by the way, Maine, you know, there's no Maine at this point, but up here, of course, this is the territory of the French in French Canada. So that's gonna be a borderland uh, with these people as well up here. And in the South, below the Carolinas, of course, is Florida. So they're in between these two great powers. And so that'll be a, a, a you know, it's part of this larger imperial conflict over time. <clears throat> and then here you have just a map, I wanna say this is the 18th century, but you have a map more or less of the territories of the British along with the Spanish and the French in the Caribbean, you know, Cuba, Santo Domingo, the French have Saint Domingue, uh, but Jamaica, um, you know, the Bahamas later on, but again, down here, uh, Antigua, um, St. Christopher, Montserrat, and then lower down here, Barbados and Southern Antilles. Uh, those are your, those are your, um, um, those are your islands, the big sugar producing islands, um, very important for the British. Now, I say ungoverned empire on that slide. I mean by comparison to the Spanish, there simply isn't very much imperial political structure in Britain in the 17th, even the 18th century. In fact, most of these, uh, most of these companies that found these, these, uh, these private colonies are given the right by the crown to set up their own governments, their own law courts, uh, according to English law, of course, but, uh, and their own colonial assemblies, uh, however they arrange things. And we'll get to a little bit of this in a second, but um, they govern themselves. The only real imperial official on the ground will be royal governors when they become, because some of them will lose their charters, they'll lose, you know, they'll, they'll, the company itself will be dissolved, they'll still have the right to govern themselves according to their charter, but they'll be given a royal governor. And that's the only, only real contact they have with the crown, one other exception. And these royal governors are, and this is fascinating because this becomes a problem obviously in the 18th century and the went up to the American Revolution, they're sent out there basically by the crown as unpaid servants of the crown. They're there to make their, make their fortune in the colonies. Well, what winds up happening, of course, is that they go there, the colonial assemblies wind up paying their salaries, which becomes a problem, of course, in the 18th century when, you know, well, they want them to do something that the crown wants and they don't want to do it. As one 18th century governor will tell 
his, the crowd, well, look, if I don't do what they want, I'll starve. <laughs> it's a big problem, as you can imagine later on. But they're sent out there because this is, you know, the reason why they're not being paid, by the way, is because we're, uh, government officials weren't supposed to be paid. You know, you're not supposed to be paid if you're governing in the early modern era. You're already wealthy. <laughs> you're governing because you are wealthy and prestigious. Government isn't supposed to be a means of engrossing yourself. It's supposed to be a means of using your largesse to, you know, help the public good and all that in theory. Members of parliament are not paid. I don't think they're paid until the 19th century. After, after, I can't remember. It. Don't quote me on that. But same, same reason. And so that's why you have this almost like this, uh, again, government by contractor in a sense, uh, in many ways. Well, this here, it's just the colonists themselves run themselves. And what the British wanted, and the reason why they didn't do a whole lot, all, all they really wanted from the North American colonies especially were they wanted raw materials. And so they passed a series of navigation acts starting in 1651 that basically forbid them from trading from anybody but the mother country, which the colonists will chafe under and eventually find ways around. Uh, but it's, the, it's that sort of mercantilist policy, trying to build up your own stock of raw materials, keep them away from your competitors. The only, the only imperial institution that exists in London throughout this entire period uh, starts out life as something called the Lords of Trade in 1675. This is uh, Charles II appoints a bunch of noblemen to be a council to advise him about governing the colonies. In the 1690s, it'll be turned into the Board of Trade and Plantations, which will have, again, can make recommendations, can you know take information from American colonists, take complaints basically, but it has no authority to do anything. It's the only body to govern the entirety of the British Empire. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. It is kind of empire on the cheap. The English simply didn't have the resources in the 17th century to do anything else. With one exception, there's one exception where the uh, English do try briefly to impose a little more structure on the American colonies. That will be the Dominion of New England. That is when in 1684, King James II, the Catholic King James of England, uh, who will get run out in 1688 by revolution, sends his governor, Sir Edmund Andros, which basically amalgamates all the Northern colonies into one, what he calls Dominion of New England, with him as head. He begins setting up a machinery of government there, gets kicked out. It'd be very interesting to see what would happen if he had stayed, if it had not been a revolution, but there was one attempt to make it more strongly governed from the center which is overthrown by the settlers because of the revolution in England in 1688-89. And then finally, one last thing to mention about all this, um, about this ungoverned empire. In 1707, you're gonna have, remember you'd had before with James I, the crowns of Scotland and England being united by a dynasty, the Stuarts. Well, what happens by the early 1700s is the last Stuart monarch, Queen Anne, uh, has no heirs, and she doesn't seem to be in line to have any, so there's real concern in London about what's going to happen if she dies without an heir. They don't want the Scots going another way. Are they going to become, you know, make alliances with the French, make alliances with someone else? And so, in fact, they're, the Scots, by the way, try to start their own colonies in the 1690s. They, they found a, a colony in the 1690s called Darien in the, in the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, it fails. So they're worried about them as potential competitors. So in order to avoid this, the uh, elites of Scotland and England decide to, well, if we, can't, if we don't want to go farther apart, we have to come closer together. So they sign a formal act as parliament, the British parliament in 1707, creating the Act of Union, which creates the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Now, after 1707, you can call it Britain. <laughs> Before, it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, uh, but this is where you get that from uh, to this day. Still, the Scots still haven't, still haven't gone independent yet. Uh, maybe they will soon. But uh, this is, of course, part of that state building process as it interacts with the process of empire building. Okay, so empire means lots of fighting. And just to go over a few of these here, I won't belabor them all. This lecture is going to be long enough, but in particular between the Spanish and, and the English. A couple of battles here I'll mention briefly because they're Spanish victories, well, partly Spanish victories. The Spanish destroy 
the first attempt at a French settlement in North America in 1563. The, the uh, French, actually a group of French Huguenots had established a, uh, a, a fort called Fort Caroline in 1563, north of St. Saint Augustine. And the uh, uh, Spanish troops destroyed it in 1563. So there you go, part of the religious war empire building thing. But of course, one of the, the biggest sort of combined victory of the Spanish in the 17th, 16th century was not against any European power or against any Christian European power, was against the, the Ottoman Empire in 1571. The large, one of the largest naval battles since antiquity was fought um, in Lepanto. You had a combined force of Spanish, Venetian, but also papal. Papacy added some, some troops to this, some ships where they uh, defeat um, the Ottomans at a, at a battle. This was hugely important for, for Christian Europe at this time. This actually, there were actually celebrations in Protestant capitals throughout Europe. They were so happy about this. Again, the Ottomans have been on the move for better part of the century. And it, was, it showed, of course, they weren't invincible. So it was really important psychologically for, for Europeans. I should say, by the way, it wasn't that big of a deal for the Ottomans. They regrouped. It was. It didn't really end their power uh, briefly. It was important as a psychological victory for, for, for uh, the Europeans, and of course, it, it burnished the Spanish reputation for military power. Which, by the way, I think this is correct. This is October seventh. Uh, that was fought on October seventh. This is the four hundred fiftieth anniversary of that battle. So, that's why people in England got frightened in the fifteen eighties when it seemed like Spain was going to finally send an invasion force. Again, you had. A cold war going on between Elizabeth I of, of, of England and Philip II of Spain. He finally gets an armada together in 1588. It gets blown off course, a lot of ships get uh, lost, and it's a big disaster, uh, which is very fortunate, by the way, for England. If they had actually landed an army in England, it would have been no contest. Spain had a much better, bigger army, would not have lasted very long. Uh, this is seen, of course, as you know, great moment in the history of Protestant England. Uh, you, know, for, you know, saved by providence from the uh, the uh, the papist hordes. Uh, it's a great thing for them. It becomes part of the sort of national mythology going forward. You also have a series of wars fought by the English later on against the Dutch. Why would you be fighting your your Protestant allies? Well, money. <laughs> uh, they're both uh, maritime powers, and so they fight. And in 1652, uh, Oliver Cromwell wins. He always wins. He never lost this war. I think he maybe lost one battle his entire career. He never ranked commander. He actually takes the city of Dunkirk uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, unfortunately, in the 1660s and the 1670s, the Dutch wiped the floor <laughs> with the English uh, at the same time. And then finally, you also have, this is the only one here where it's directly the only time the English and the Spanish actually fight is in the New World. Well, directly there. There's a war in the 17, uh, early 1700s called, uh, in Europe called the War of Spanish Succession. The last Habsburg monarch uh, dies without an heir and he leaves in his will the crown of Spain and all its colonies to uh, the nephew of the King of France, Louis XIV. And nobody in Europe other than Spain and France wants this. They don't want France becoming a great power. So they gang up to start stop them. The point is you have uh, pretty brutal conflicts between British settlers and their Indian allies coming from Carolinas and Spanish uh, settlers and, the Carol uh, and their uh, Indian allies from Florida uh, going on in, uh, in the early part of, uh, of the 18, uh, 1700s. So much so that it, it winds up wiping out all of the Indian missions in Florida. They, a lot of Indians are killed. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a bit of religious element of this. Uh, I believe, uh, I think it's the, where I read this, the Catholic Diocese of Tallahassee, Florida, has tried to start a case for the, for the, um, whatever, beatification of some of these Indians who died as martyrs because the Indian allies, the British, I guess, killed them because they had converted. So there's this, there's again, a weird religious element going on here, but only on the fringes of empire do you get the actual conflict between Spain and uh, England. 
the same time, I say colonial conflict, these are mostly conflict with natives. You also have conflicts going on with the natives. In, uh, in uh, Virginia, you have a series of wars starting in 1609 between the English settlers and uh, the Powhatan, the Algonquian Indians, Powhatan is their chief. In 1609, um, the first one starts, 1609, is, is uh, thwarted in 1614 when the English captured Pocahontas, you know the story, her conversion to Christianity and marriage to John Rolfe, managed to smooth things over. However, the English thought things were smoothed over. They weren't. 1622, uh, the uh, Algonquians um, uh, attack and kill um, uh, somewhere a quarter or a third of, uh, of the Jamestown colony's inhabitants. Uh, they retaliate by seizing uh, Indian fields and forcing Indians into slavery. It's a pretty brutal, brutal 10 year war, which ends with a truce. Uh, there's one more set of uh, battles in 1644. The last of these uh, chiefs is uh, captured, and from then on, a, a lasting, if not generous, peace treaty is signed. Eventually, in 1677, an Articles of Peace, so-called, is set up, which basically puts the Algonquian Indians of Virginia totally under the control of the English. Same time, you have wars being fought in New England. Uh, the so-called Pequot Wars are fought uh, by uh, Puritans in uh, Massachusetts. In the 1630s, the uh, Pequot warriors had attacked um, English uh, farmers, who intruded on their lands. Retaliation, Puritan militiamen and their Indian allies uh, massacred uh, some 500 of the Pequots. By the 1670s, uh, the natives of, um, of, of New England had been depleted uh, by disease. By 1670s, they were outnumbered, I want to say 16,000 to 55,000 by, by uh, English settlers. And so at that point, desperately trying to stop the, uh, the, uh, the English advance, the uh, Wampanoag uh, leader, Metacom, forged a military alliance with other tribes in 1675, went around attacking uh, white settlements and killing white settlers, uh, which continued until his death in 1676. Losses were high on both sides, but they were much worse on the Indian side. 25% of the Indian population died from war or disease during Medicom's war. Many of them had to flee further inland and they went back country where they intermarried with other tribes allied to the French. Another, and lastly, you have a couple of rebellions against colonial rule. The first ones by English colonists themselves, Bacon's Rebellion of 1676. By the 1670s, uh, aspiring tenants, tenants, poor freeholders and populist men, uh, found there was not a lot of land to be had in the areas that were under English control. And so they wanted to have uh, local Indians removed from uh, lands along the frontier that were guaranteed by treaties. They could take the land themselves. The wealthy merchant planters didn't want this. Uh, they wanted to maintain the labor supply and continue trading with the, with the Indians. So what happened is uh, these poor white settlers, these poor English settlers began forming militias and killing Indians. In 1675, the Indians retaliate by killing whites. Not wanting the fur trade to be disrupted, uh, the governor, Governor William Barclay, proposed building frontier forts. The settlers saw this as a strategy to impose high taxes on them and impose and take control of the tobacco trade. So a, mem a member of the governor's council named Nathaniel Bacon led a protest against Bacon, a Berkeley strategy. They also, uh, him and his men, Bacon, went and killed a number of peaceful Indians for which Berkeley arrested him. Uh, when Bacon's supporters threatened to free Bacon by force, Berkeley, Berkeley agreed to political reforms and to restoring voting rights, which had been taken away from landless freedmen, not satisfied. Bacon's men went to Jamestown and burned it to the ground, issuing a uh, manifesto, or which demand removal of all Indians and an, an end to a rule of what they called wealthy parasites. Eventually, within the next year, uh, he dies of smallpox, uh, and eventually the revolt is put down. But it's a huge turning point over the sea in the history of the North American colonies. Then finally, you're going to have a uh, massive revolt in the northern part of New Spain called the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, when reacting against uh, policies of the uh, uh, of the Spanish religious policies in particular, you have Pueblo Indians throw off 
their um, their their Spanish rulers uh, successfully uh, for the better part of you know decade or so until they finally um, Spanish rule is uh, reestablished in 1692. So empire leads to, of course, people fighting back against it, obviously, both native and, of course, Europeans themselves. <clears throat> For a while here, okay. So a few comparisons. I'm going to compare the Spanish and the English, you know, empires, British empires, in two ways: both their religious policies, religion, the two empires, and uh, slavery. So we'll start with the religious policies first. Now, the first thing to note about the Spanish Empire, remember where the background of all this is, the Reconquista, the importance of conversion. The Spanish crown did try to pass laws which um, to protect to a certain degree the native peoples they encountered. Uh, one of these was the so-called um, Law of Burgos in 1512, which, which regulated what was owed you know, monetarily to Indian laborers. Another in 1513 becomes famous as the Requiermento. This is the idea that the Spanish conquistadors had to at least try to convert the Indians before they conquered them. Why? Because, hey, if they're pagans, you can go to conquer them, I guess. And this is what happens, for example, when Francisco Pizarro goes into uh, Cusco to confront a Hualpa. He actually has fires go there, hold up a Bible, and start talking to um, to Atahualpa, they hand him a picture of the Bible he can't read. So it's pointless, but um, they at least have to do it. Pizarro was coming for conquest. He didn't care about conversion. Um, but it was at least, again, a nod toward the idea that you have to convert and it's a, it's a religious purpose to this in many ways. Uh, and so that's one element of all this. The other thing I want to mention about the religious policies is that the, uh, the missions and the, the various uh, religious jurisdictions they exercised were kind of the counterpart to the civilian bureaucracy set up by the Spanish. Um, they play a key role um, uh, in terms of governing the Indians. They, they are the only ones theoretically permitted to live in native communities, and they both perform the work of conversion, education, and stuff like that as well as imposing Spanish practices in terms of economic activities, farming, stuff like this. Mostly carry out in villages uh, that predate the conquest, places like that. Um, priests followed very um, uh, quickly on the heels of conquest. The first ones arrived in 1523. By 1526, the Spanish government required that two priests accompany every expedition made in the New World. And so you're going to have, uh, again, uh, pretty much um, uh, having um, them this role as, you know, um, protector, but also sort of like, how do I put this? Well, literally, there actually is an office of protector set up in 1516. Uh, it's called Protector of the Indians by the, um, by the, um, by the Spanish crown, which is filled by by churchmen. The first ones will come back to this man in Bartolomé de las Casas. Now, in terms of how they actually treat the Indians, one of the things you need to note about this is that, yes, you did have, you're going to have um, um, missionaries encouraging Indians to assimilate to Spanish Catholic mores. You do have them at certain times uh, punishing things like, you know, idolatry, they'll smash their statues, they'll do stuff like this. They'll punish really severely those who worship traditional gods. On the other hand, and things like, you know, um, compulsory attendance at mass and stuff like this are required of people who live in these missions, that they go to work every day and they work in the fields. Their lives aren't that different than the sort of peasants were back in Europe to a certain degree. Um, and though they could be kind of brutal, they also gave at least a certain amount of education to these uh, to these Indians. The mission system did provide an opportunity, for example, to learn the language of their their occupiers, and learn how to manipulate them for their own evidence, for their own uh, needs to a certain degree. And you shouldn't you shouldn't, by the way, see this as being a total separation. We're going to get this in a moment of Indians from Spaniards. You had the initial conquistadors; a lot of them took uh, native wives. Um, Remember, they had Indian allies. So uh, these Indian allies may have been princes or princes in their, you know, royal blood in their own country. So it was a way for Spanish soldiers, many of whom weren't, you know, were peasants themselves to become, you know, 
you know, whatever, in, uh, native royalty or whatever, something like that, native nobility. Uh, and so some of the end plus some of these Native Americans who adopted Spanish ways would become brokers between their culture and Spanish culture. Yeah, and so conquest is always brutal. However, um, there was uh, a strand of thinking in the Spanish world that you couldn't do certain things, at least to the Indians. And in fact, this actually goes back to a lot of natural law thinking in the Middle Ages. It gets expressed in a, another papal bull, Paul III, issues Salunas Deus in 1837, in which the Pope declared that, quote, Indians were capable of understanding the Catholic faith, unquote, meaning that they were fully understanding and capable of receiving Christianity. Therefore, they were human, that there were natural laws applied. You couldn't do certain things to convert them. In other words, you couldn't convert them violently. And in fact, uh, if you're wondering why this is even a question, you have ideas coming from the middle, coming from the ancient world, actually, which this is gets to the debate at Valladolid in a second, um, coming from Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, who argued in the ancient world that some people are naturally slaves, and therefore they need to be enslaved. They need to be sort of, they need to be in permanent tutelage to somebody that's superior to them. And early modern societies found support for slavery in this, and to a lesser degree uh, in Spain, for references to the Old Testament in the Bible. On the other hand, you're going to have people like Thomas More uh, in Utopia um, giving a positive evaluation of peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And so you're going to have other early explorers seeing the Indians as being, you know, intelligent, this being like a sort of, you know, paradise or something like this. Some early Spaniards even saw similarities between Spanish Catholic culture and the native cultures they encountered. In fact, one uh, Portuguese rabbi, when he heard about the, the discovery of the new world, latched on to similarities with the native peoples and proposed that these Indians they had found might be one of the lost tribes of Israel, you know, the biblical story. So again, there was debate about who the Indians were. They didn't actually know. What's going to happen, of course, is that as the decades go on, you're going to have people in the church begin to criticize um, the Spanish conquest. Most famously, Bartolome de las Casas, a Franciscan missionary mentioned before, he's the office of protector of the Indians, whose father had sailed with Columbus uh, to the New World. And he writes, I don't have the date here for some reason, a, his a history of the conquest of the Americas, which is scathing which indicts the Spanish authorities for their cruelty and particularly for their failure to convert the Indians. That was his big thing. He said they would naturally convert if you wouldn't be so uh, vicious. By the way, both those claims for Wiley are, are exaggerated, but that's what he was there to do, protect the Indians. And so in 1542, the King of Spain, Charles V, actually called a halt officially to the, the conquest of the New World and set up a debate between Bartolome de las Casas and Juan uh, Idel Sepulveda, who was a humanist and a lawyer, on the question of the morality of conversion and how it could be affected. Uh, de las Casas took the argument that the Indians could not be treated, they, couldn't be, they could not be converted by violence. They couldn't be just conquered. They had natural rights as member of the human race that could not be disregarded. This is one of the first assertions of that kind that I'm aware of. Whereas Sepulveda took the other argument. He argued because the Indians practiced, because the Indians were, you know, practiced things like human sacrifice. Um, he's right, by the way, they did practice human sacrifice. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice on a massive scale. It's one of the reasons Cortez and his men reacted part of the way where they did. Cannibalism, but also other, what he, other, other, other practices that he called, quote, crimes against nature, that any means we could be used to force them to convert, including warfare. Um, again, the debate, I'll get to the new law in a second. The, the issues that they issue a law does the, the Spanish crown on the basis of this inconclusive debate. There's no winner declared. I mention this because the conquest, conquests are always brutal and they always lead to cruelty and, and, uh, and violence and suffering. However, what's going to happen in the context of the 16th and the 17th century is that you're going to have Protestant, Dutch, and, and English propaganda blow this up into sort of mythic proportions. 
that you know the the Spaniards are sort of randomly killing every Indian they see. That, that, and they're taking, by the way, uh, they'll take excerpts from you know Bartolomé de las Casas's works to do this, and sort of you know use them as propaganda. This is sometimes referred to as the the Black Legend in uh, in historiography uh, historiographical term historiographical term I should say. And give you an example, one of the things that I'll latch onto was the Inquisition in the New World, right? The Inquisitions, you know, torturing poor natives and torturing Protestants. And this, there's a sort of, you know, parallel drawn between them here. And it is true that inquisitorial courts could, could abuse their authority. They did, you know, punish Indians really harshly for heresy. They could make the life of conversos, people who were Jewish, who had converted, um, miserable at times. Um, it's also true that many clergy were actually prosecuted for abusing the Indians. We have lots of records. So whatever else you can say, the inquisitors took their job seriously. We have like hundreds of pages of documents for these trials. And um, they did, they did actually. I mean, I don't think they were normally thrown in prison, or they, but they did, did it remove, they did remove abusive um, officials. Uh, again, that was the church's job there, basically. Again, didn't all this do this very well, but they did it. I can tell you this, um, there definitely was no debate about what to do to the Indians <laughs> in Britain when they got there. Um, and in fact, again, I may have mentioned this earlier in one of my lectures, I can't remember, but if you don't know, the, the Spanish, the, Inquis the Inquisition actually everywhere took a very different line toward things like witchcraft than in people elsewhere in Europe, doing the British. They tended to see things like that as a matter of superstition, of the ignorance of the, of the common people. So they didn't really punish it that harshly. You can oppose this to what happens in Puritan New England, where even before, like, you know, the seven witch trials, like even before that in 1692, when that happens, from, uh, to give a parallel here, between 1647 and 16, uh, 1662, the uh, civil authorities in, uh, in Massachusetts and Connecticut hanged 14 people for witchcraft. They hanged, they killed 19 in 1692. So where much of that was ever done at all in the new world because the Inquisition had fairly high standards for evidence and it had a different mortality. Doesn't make it great, it doesn't, but, and you can overdo the black legend thing by the way, but it is partly a matter of propaganda um, issued by uh, their rivals for imperial control. So what about the religion in North America? Obviously very different. There's not one dominant religious power. There are basically two majority uh, religious bodies in the new world. One of course is the Church of England. Uh, that's the representatives of the established, legally established church in back in the mother country, comes to, to the new world with the first uh, uh, colonists at Jamestown in 1607. And, um, the colony, none of the colonies were ever religiously homogenous. They all, there were always, you know, different people, different backgrounds, but the Church of England becomes strongest in Virginia. And it's kind of worth noting just the beginning in, in Virginia there, it gets established in 1619 officially legally, but it's very different from the church in England because there are no bishops in the new world. And it's pretty much under the control of lay people. Uh, the colonial assemblies will, you know, appoint ministers, they'll, they'll, they'll pass laws for the church in Virginia, but also parish vestries, these are parish committees, will have a lot of control over the appointment of ministers and things of this nature, much more than England, which they share with, it's the Bishop of London back in England who, who oversees this. And for the first several decades, there's a severe clergy shortage in, uh, in Virginia, mostly gets filled by immigrants who come to this big vast territory there's not enough you know ministers to go around for all these different you know churches and stuff like this by the end of the century it becomes uh the uh, things change the bishop of london from the 1670s onwards begins appointing um more uh more and better ministers to uh the church there and it'll become the predominant um religious body in places like new york eventually uh in most of the uh southern colonies a few of the middle colonies as well the other model, the other state saying, and I say state sanctioned, none of these, there are states run, state supported bodies in these, these colonies. None of them have the authority that say the Catholic church would have in Spain. There's too much diversity there from the beginning. The biggest exception to this would be Congregationalist New England in Massachusetts, in, in Connecticut, not in Rhode Island, which has religious liberty more or less, 
because of Roger Williams there, you have the tightest connection between church and the state. Now, you have initially in, in Massachusetts, the right to vote is tied to church membership. If you're not part of a church, you can't vote, you can't be part of the political community. And to be part of the Puritan church in Massachusetts, you had to have a conversion experience. One of these big, you know, conversion, you know, road to Damascus type moments, which you wrote a sort of conversion narrative about be, to get into the church. You had to, you had to have an adult experience. You could be baptized, but that, that didn't make you a real member of the church. Remember, this is Protestant ideals here. And, uh, and so this, and so you have that general tight connection. Although on the other hand, it's mostly run by laymen too. There's no, there are no, like for example, the Church of England has its own law courts, you know, canonical courts. There are no law courts. The civil courts ha handle religious affairs in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And um, in Connecticut, you'll have a little different setup as well. It had an established church, but it let non-church members vote. Um, and, you, and so you'll have this very different setup there, and it'll be predominant. Um, it'll be predominant in a way more so than the uh, Church of England is in the other colonies. Whereas in other places, the middle colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, you're going to have much more diversity because of, you know, the Dutch, who had the Dutch Reformed was the church in New York before it was taken over. Eventually, the, the, uh, the Church of England is established there legally, but it's given privileges. There's no, there's never any hint of anything like persecution. It can never go on because of all the diversity there. You also have um, uh, diversity, of course, uh, in Pennsylvania, you have the other colony that has religious toleration and religious freedom on the island, William Penn's um, Pennsylvania. Initially, well, initially it was a colony for Catholics, but Maryland actually passed a toleration act, uh, its assembly did in 1649. When it gets overthrown, the government in 1689, by the revolution of 1688, they established the Church of England after that. So they went from being free to not being free uh, in uh, regards to the, that, uh, that place. And so it's much more, again, like government itself, much more a matter of private initiative to a large degree. Or you have, on the other hand, the two, the two established churches, basically, but never anything like what you have in the Spanish colonies. And then finally, you do have efforts at conversion of the Native Americans. It's never as big a priority for the English or the Dutch or any of those settlers in the New World as it is for the Spanish. What they do in Virginia, for example, when they first get there, is that they they thought that um, they thought conversion to Christianity would lead to less conflict and lead them allow them to sort of co-opt the Indians. So they began by asking Indian families to send boys to the, their colonies so that it exposed them to Christianity and to civilization. Um, and this happened a little bit, but for the most part, the Indians didn't bite. So they shifted to offering land and homes and cattle to Indian families to live in the colony uh, to get them exposed again to English culture, none of which really, really, um, really uh, worked very well. Um, and in fact, it produced some bicultural natives who could speak the language and everything, but for the most part, it didn't really work for conversion purposes. Uh, in fact, most Protestant missionary efforts in the 17th uh, century, 16th, 17th century are pretty much a bust. Most of the, the great missionary work in the Christian world that takes place in the 16th, 17th centuries is done by the Catholic Church. In Spanish America, following conquest, but other places, you know, the Jesuits, for example, go into well, they go into North America and the French too, but um, to uh, to India, to China, and Japan, and places like that. The uh, most successful, if there's any success at all, is, uh, Protestant missions are in New England, where you have so-called praying towns set up, where you again you have Indians under the guidance of a minister come to convert in villages themselves apart from, that's the difference between that and Virginia, apart from, um, from uh, European colonists there. But even those praying towns didn't convert uh, a, a real large number of population. Okay, so finally we come to the issue of slavery, sensitive issue. When Columbus got to the New World in 1492, he was primarily interested in finding gold, <laughs> along with converting natives. And uh, but he recognized the Caribbean's uh, islanders' potential value as slaves. And uh, 
he actually returned on one of his trips to Spain with uh, 500 enslaved Taino Indians. Uh, only 300 would actually survive the voyage. However, his slaving exploits, uh, which he saw as an attempt uh, to make up for the gold he didn't find, were actually cut short by Ferdinand and Isabella of Castile. Um, they weren't really all that into the Spanish slave trade, to, uh, to the slave trade itself. The um, uh, policies were kind of contradictory. I mean, the Spanish market marks themselves tried to protect uh, Amerindians from abuse. At the same time, they expected them to accept Spanish rule, embrace Catholicism. And they became early on this primary source of labor in these colonies, obviously. Uh, to give you an example, um, in 1501, the monarchs ordered Hispaniola's governor to return all property stolen from the Tainos and pay them wages for their labor, even as they're being subject to the Spanish and dying of diseases and stuff like this. So a lot of contradictions there in terms of what they want to do. I've mentioned some of the laws they passed already. Uh, and so and so basically the, the Spanish basically, again, on the one hand, they were ambivalent toward the slave trade. On the other hand, they allowed um, their uh, explorers and, and conquistadors to sort of outright enslave uh, people within the Americas. And so again, so you have this, again, this ambivalence with in, in the Spanish Empire. Now I mentioned earlier the debate about all this and de las Casas and the so-called new laws. And so um, what's gonna happen as you know, voices get raised against this, in uh, 1542, um, among the first decrees of the so-called new laws issued by Charles V, um, one of them in 1542 was the abolition of slavery itself. Um, Indians from then on were no longer required to work without pay, and Spanish colonists could, uh, children could no longer inherit encomienda. So it put an end to that sort of tribute system, so at least that part of it anyway. These changes met with really harsh resistance uh, from colonists in Mexico and Peru. Um, partly because some of these colonists have become basically little kings in their own right. And some of these new laws were only partially enforced in these colonies. So um, it did result, however, again, in, in uh, the uh, alleviation of at least the worst aspects uh, of this for the native populations. And then finally, by the time you get to the 1540s, disease has wiped disease and you know overwork has wiped out so many of the Native Americans they begin looking elsewhere for um, for labor so they begin to look to Africa um, uh, 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 in the 1540s for slaves in fact you already have um, African slaves arriving to the Americas in the 1520s uh, partly to work in uh, sugar plantations in Brazil they began arriving in uh, Spanish territories in the 1520s, as I, as I uh, mentioned there. And so uh, the largest number of, of, of black slaves arrived in Spanish colonies between 1550 and 1650, corresponding with the growth of uh, cultivation of sugar in uh, Spanish America. It's the sugar plantations that really drive the slave trade, both in uh, the Spanish Empire, especially in the British Empire. Uh, sugar cultivation is brutal work. And a lot of these slaves are just worked to death um, because of this. Uh, however, um, on the mainland, the number of imported African slaves dies out after 1650. And in fact, between um, the middle of the 17th and the end of the uh, 18th century, the slaves of African origin disappear as an identifiable racial group in New Spain. The reason being is that you're gonna have uh, a caste uh, system uh, grow in the uh, in the new world in new spain which has been one of the big differences between um slavery and social relationships in you know, racial relationships in new spain and in the american colonies is that you're going to have this multi-layered system of racial categories which is sometimes called the sistema de castas i mean it's there, there are all these terms i won't go through them all of mixed race you know mixed you know spanish indian spanish african uh, the term they used was costas for all, everybody of mixed race. And in fact, you're gonna have, again, different you know, uh, status obviously for African slaves, for Africans, Indians, costas, and then Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking people. And, and so it's very different in the sense that it is supposed to be this rigid hierarchy, very rigid, like purity of blood was something that gets into that phrase, gets into you know, Spanish laws about this stuff. 
that in practice perhaps wasn't that sh as strictly enforced as we might used to think. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute uh, just to illustrate this, but there was a, a caste system in that sense uh, in the uh, in the in New Spain. This is a, some image of an African slave from a, uh, a German book uh, depicting peoples of the New World in 1529. Christopher, actually, you should need you know, a comment there. Christopher Weiditz, German, obviously, Trachtenburg. I'm going to give you an idea of how they depicted in the slave. You see him carrying something there. But the more interesting is, is something, it's a genre of painting that's become popular with the uh, scholars over the last several decades. It's called Costa paintings. They date from the 18th century, and they're, they're paintings which depict the various gradations of mixed race peoples in, in New Spain. And I won't go through all this stuff, but you can see all the different, you can just look at the, I hate to say it, look at the color of their skin, see all the gradations uh, of color and race. And these used to be thought, you know, sort of symbols of oppression, but we found out recently that a lot of, some of these, these actual paintings were actually, they were commissioned by Costa families themselves. They may have been portraits of, you know, you just now see some of them here. They actually look like they're fairly well off by people who were proud of their lineage, despite the fact of it being mixed race. So it's a little more, uh, again, there's almost this ideal of purity of blood, but in practice, they're sort of, you know, because of what went on there, obviously they couldn't be too, uh, too enforcing of this. But I point this out to note the difference between this and what you'll get in the British colonies, where there is no sort of gradation. There's just black, white uh, going into the colonial and then into the later periods. Which brings us finally to servitude in British America, which is the last thing to mention here. When we talk about servitude in British America, we're talking about more than slavery, because besides slaves, you also have indentured servants. And in fact, for much of the 1600s, uh, indentured servants made up the majority of the workforce for people in, um, in the, the new British colonies, indentured servants and convicts, who in many cases were treated basically like you think slaves were traded. Um, in fact, in the beginning, a few Indians were enslaved, um, uh, worked as servants were enslaved. But by the 1670s, the ratio of, of white uh, servants to enslaved Africans was four to one. So you have this massive influx of these people coming from, uh, from Britain to what indentured servitude is, by the way, is you'll sign a contract and you'll labor for seven years to work off the terms of the contract. And with the idea, you'll set yourself up a trade or something, you'll have some money left over. In practice, it left a lot of people basically in debt for life. It was kind of like a form of slavery in another way, in, in other words. And thousands of these came from to the Chesapeake in North America and to the Caribbean. And uh, planters benefited greatly from this. It was basically a scam to get them cheap labor. <laughs> uh, uh, in theory, in Virginia, under the headright system, a planter would receive 50 additional acres for every servant he shipped to the colony. And so, and a good servant could produce more than his purchase price in just one year. So it was a way of getting cheap labor for, for these people. And many masters exploited these servants, um, beat them without cause, withheld permission to marry, uh, sold the contracts of disobedient workers. They could sell them whenever they wanted. Most of these people did not escape from slavery. And I should point out, not all these indentured servants were white. Some of them were, were free blacks in, in the beginning. Um, only about 25% of them really made well out of this. Female servants generally fared better. They could marry up if they wanted to. <clears throat> what happens is, again, you probably know the date by now, the first Africans uh, purchased from Portuguese slavers made their way to, uh, to Jamestown in 1619. But they really begin to uh, form part of the workforce first in the Caribbean because that's where the sugar plantations are. And um, they quickly shifted to that from, from indentured servants. And by the 1660s, they had passed the first comprehensive slave code to control the black majority. <clears throat> and in fact, up until the 16, uh, end of the 17th century, uh, laws governing Africans were very different um, than they become later on. They could see they could um, be servants for life, but they could also be indentured servants. And in fact, um, English common law did not acknowledge uh, legal ownership of slaves. 
And in fact, early on in the colonies, in many places, you could become free if you're a, an enslaved African by becoming a Christian. In English common law, you couldn't weren't allowed to enslave Christians. You could also, in certain cases, buy your freedom or petition for one's freedom from the courts. Um, we know of free African, free people of African descent who actually lived as landowners, who actually um, lived more or less equal with other settlers early on in some of the life of some of these colonies. They even purchased their own slaves at certain points. What happens to change all this is that in the 1660s, the, uh, there's a depression in the tobacco industry in the Chesapeake. And they begin enacting laws that lower the status of Africans. And in fact, by the 1690s, the ratio of white to black servants will, will uh, uh, black to black slaves, to white servants will shift. Um, it'll, it'll be uh, four to one uh, Africans to uh, slaves to white servants in the 1690s. And the reason for this is twofold. Uh, one is because, because of the dep depression, um, slaves became an alternative uh, mode of, uh, of labor, but also because of Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, what I didn't mention about that in 1676 is a lot of indentured servants flocked to Nathaniel Bacon's banner. And so increasingly white planters begin to think, hey, those, uh, those, those white English people actually don't like working. They're used to having freedom back in England. <laughs> so they end up in turn increasingly to African slaves. Moreover, um, the, um, the, uh, fall, the uh, flow of servants from England would actually drop off after 1680. But even more important than that, after 16, uh, the, uh, the uh, price of purchasing African slaves had been um, uh, kept artificially high why? Because there was a, a company, the, the uh, Royal Africa Company, that had a monopoly on the slave trade, again, one of those joint stock companies, which kept the price artificially high to keep out competitors. What happened was in 1690, after the revolution in England, which I'll get to in a few weeks, um, that company is dissolved and the price of African slaves plummets. They come really much cheaper. And so after 1690, what's going to happen throughout the colonies and definitely in places like Virginia, you can see the laws changing before, over the decades. You'll start to have laws being passed that create African chattel slavery. They go from, you know, this being this murky where they can be kind of be free to being no, African equals slave where you can no longer be freed by becoming Christian, it doesn't matter. If you're African of descent, if you've been born a slave, you're always a slave. Uh, and you can see this in, um, uh, you begin to have laws, even before this in the 1660s, um, laws being passed uh, when there are, you know, um, uh, limiting the freedoms of free blacks. So that by 1705, most of the freedoms that they had enjoyed, there are few, there are very few free blacks left, uh, have been closed off. And by 1705, you can see it clearly in the laws. That, like you look at the Virginia laws, you know, can't intermarry with whites anymore, can't own property. Those sorts of things have been cut off to make them permanently slaves. Uh, and in fact, by 1723, and getting a little beyond the period I was going to talk about here. The Assembly of Virginia actually denied all free blacks the right to vote. Uh, a crown, even the a move, even the, the British crown contested. Um, but for the most part, it is uh, uh, it is this change that occurs um, because of economics, really, that became an economic thing upon which you built this legal superstructure, which eventually will be built this ideological superstructure of racism and sort of things this, of this nature. Really had not been a real heavy emphasis on race before these things, which of course creates an African slave community. And that's another reason, by the way, initially to want slaves. Again, they're initially coming from different parts of Africa where they can't speak the same language. So, but in time, of course, in the 18th century, they'll become naturalized. Okay, just a couple of images, just last things to wrap up here, this long, long lecture. Apologize for the length, but I want to be comprehensive. This is an 18th century, just an image of tobacco planters in Virginia. Uh, tobacco made made uh, the colonies in, in, you know, in North America profitable. You can see African slaves in the background. Let's see the slave holding up the thing over the master there. And then finally, again, just to, again, I, I don't do this, by the way, to, um, I'm trying to contextualize the, the slavery here in the new world. I'm not meaning to say that slavery wasn't worse than indentured servitude. Just to show you that they weren't that as different as you think. You take a look here. This, this left one's, I think, from 1769. 
the right ones from 1774. These are newspaper advertisements, advertisements for the selling of indentured servants, selling their selling their contracts. And um, and again, it's going this is this is on the eve of the American Revolution. In fact, they decline precipitously the number of indentured servants, but they are still there are still indentured servants in the United States in the early Republic. So it doesn't really go away. It's still a part of this. Uh, it's just that, in fact, over time, the situation of the African slaves becomes worse and worse. Once it becomes clear to planters, this is our ticket uh, to wealth. So, but uh, again, um, interesting uh, what happens in the contrast there. So that is it. Uh, that is all for this lecture. So <laughs> hope that I'll feed into a little bit what we'll do the next couple of weeks. I'm going to start talking about culture in the next couple of weeks. Baroque culture and affluentism, which goes a little bit with empire. It's partly imperial, but uh, uh, that's the lecture for this time. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you got through it, uh, I, I um, uh, take care and uh, happy hunting.